Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for DMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are looking at the optional class features introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. All classes got some new cool features in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Some offered features that just get added to your roster automatically. Others had features where you had to replace existing features with them. A lot of the spell casting classes got new spells added to their spell list. And with today's video, looking at three of the primary spell casters in D&D, we're probably going to be looking at a lot of new spells and some new ways to use those spells. Let's make the magic happen and get rolling. So kicking things off, let's start with the Sorcerer. And first and foremost, let's talk about the new additional spells that Sorcerers got. This is a pretty robust spell list with some brand new Tasha's spells added in. I love seeing the addition here of Mind Sliver and Tasha's Mind Whip, but notably the Sorcerer does not get any of the summoning spells. A little disappointing, but there's other great options here though. Sorcerers now get Flaming Sphere. So in our class guide that we made many years ago where I recommended taking Flaming Sphere as a sorcerer, now you actually can. <laughs> yes, we were future-proofing our episode. Yep. It yep. wasn't a mistake, it was, f it was divination. Yeah, you also now get Bigby's Hand, another amazing spell for sorcerers as well, especially because it's a great one to have for extra damage while you're using things like your other meta magics or other options to punch people with that fist. Beyond getting Demiplane, there's nothing in this list that really strikes me off the top as interacting with the sorcerer's meta magics in an unexpected way. I love seeing a lot of these spells that have been added in here. Uh, I won't say that they're groundbreaking for the sorcerer, but I do say that it's it's a necessary boost, and a lot of these spells deserve to be there. Yeah, but there's just nothing in here that's like, oh, well, that would be crazy if you could twin spell this, except for maybe Flesh to Stone. But even then... Yeah. Uh, Flesh to Stone still isn't a, a primary pick for me, I don't yeah. think. Uh, as we move on to their next feature, though, uh, something that we love to see on Sorcerers is more options for meta magic. But do these two new meta magics make the cut? So the first one is Seeking Spell. You can spend two sorcery points when you miss with a spell that uses an attack roll to re-roll the d20, and then you must accept the next result. I think this one's a trap. Here's instantly what I don't like about it. So as a person who has taken the lucky feet. Okay. And how everybody says the lucky feet is broken. And there have been more than one. I'm going to say like 25% of the instances that I've used the lucky feet. I still don't roll as well with my second d20. The roll of a d20 is always a gamble that you're taking. The dice gods giveth and the dice gods taketh away if i'm spending two sorcery points what i would have rather seen is something like you can turn a miss into a success by using maybe it costs a few an extra sorcery point three sorcery points to automatically succeed because you're going to blow through those sorcery points or two sorcery points for a plus five to your dice roll that way you can kind of make an educated guess on whether it's worth it or not the thing that I think is there's actually not a lot of spells that use attack rolls that aren't either A, a cantrip, or B, a concentration spell that you get to attack with continually over and over again. So, like, you could use this with Blade of Disaster, okay, but the blade can just attack the next round. Like, maybe if you, if you have to kill something, great. Um, you could use this with Bigby's Hand. You could use this with a cantrip, but it feels expensive to use two sorcery points to reroll something that you can just try again on a subsequent round. Again, I guess if you need the damage now, sure, but if you need the damage now, it feels like there's other things that you should have done before relying on this one. Yeah. Um, and then the other sorcerer spells like Chromatic Orb, like, yes, it sucks to miss with Chromatic Orb. It sucks to miss with maybe Scorching Ray. But again, I, I think that to make this worthwhile, you would have to load up on a lot of those attack roll based spells. And the surprising thing is that there's just not a lot of them. I also want to say that, like, is this option terrible? No, it's not terrible. 
but you only get a limited number of meta magics that you get to choose. So really the question has to be, is this one as good as other options out there? And I think there are other meta magics that I would gladly take before this one. I, this is very bottom of my, uh, bottom of my list. Again, maybe sometime in the future there'll be an amazing high-level spell or good spell that requires an attack roll, and this is the ticket for it. But even with a lot of those spells too, oftentimes spells that require attack rolls are ones that are really good for twinning, as an example. Yeah. And so I, well, I would just point out that like Chromatic Orb twinned is pretty cool for one sorcery point compared to this, which is... Two, like. It's one of those things where, again, Twin Spell just kind of shows its dominance again. The next meta magic option that sorcerers get is Transmute Spell. Now, this one got a lot of talk and a lot of excitement from the community. Yeah. But I actually think that this one is a bit of a trap in how excited people got for it. I think people got excited for it in the wrong reasons. Um, not all the wrong reasons. There are a lot of cool things that you can do with Transmute Spell, which allows you to change the damage type of your spell into another damage type. Mainly if you're using Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, Poison, or Thunder damage. Now, the trap here, I think, is that a lot of people look at the Draconic Sorcerer. Yeah. Where you pick a Draconic Bloodline and you get to do additional damage with that damage type. So if you are a Fire Draconic Sorcerer and you transmute your Lightning Bolt into a Flame Bolt, is it worth it to use the Sorcery Points to get your Charisma Score as damage? I don't think so. It's, it's, it's actually strictly worse than using Empowered Spell, I em think. Empowered Spell yeah. is going to be a better option almost all the time. So rather than using Transmute Spell to switch the damage type, you should take Empowered Spell instead. Where Transmute Spell, I think, does have a place is if you're in a campaign or you're running into situations time and time again where you have taken a lot of fire spells and you keep dealing with, like, demons and fiends mm. and dragons who are resistant or immune to fire damage. If you find yourself kind of screwed because of the damage type that you focused on, this meta magic could change the game for you. But again, you're now dishing out a lot of sorcery points where I think it would be better to just reevaluate the spell choices you've made. Yeah, again, if you're building around a theme, sure. I just think that we need to make sure that there's more spells of every elemental damage type first of all, so that dragon sorcerers have more of an arsenal to draw upon. But I also think that now sorcerers have such a nice spell list, and especially with the advent of things like the Clockwork Soul and the Aberrant Mind, it's really easy to load up on spells that deal Force, Psychic, Radiant, and Thunder damage, which are damage types that are almost never resisted. And you're, there, I don't think there's a single creature in the game that is resistant, like... If a creature is resistant to Force, Psychic, or Radiant, it is usually resistant to only one of those three. I think there might be a monster that's resistant to Psychic and Force, but even that... I, I mean, I'm not yeah. going to be any help here. I, yeah. I barely remember resistance. It's it, 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 in effect, it's very rare for a creature to be resistant to more than one of those. Yeah, so when we look at these two meta magic options, I think... Do I enjoy the idea of having more meta magic options? Yeah, especially with new feats that were added in, like Meta Magic Adapt. Maybe that makes a better case for picking one of these mm. if it suits your play style. But I do think that in our list of meta magics, I still think that my character, my sorcerer right now, has three, and I wish I could choose another two from the existing list yeah. before I would look at these options. However, uh, if you do want to experiment, the new Sorceress Versatility feature allows you to change out what meta magic you know and even change out one of your cantrips whenever you gain an ability score increase from your class. So again, giving sorcerers just a couple more retraining options. And I actually think that the ability to retrain your meta magic as you level up is pretty great because there's certain levels, especially early on, where you want to have, you, you know, Twin Spell and Quicken Spell take a little bit of time to come into their own. Yeah. And so you might want to take advantage of that to retrain them in, as opposed to having to wait till a higher level to get them. And if you're like me and realize after a few levels that you really wish you had taken Subtle Spell, well, yeah. once you hit level four, you can just say, okay, 
I can do that. Yeah. At fifth level, you gain magical guidance. Now you can use a sorcery point to re-roll an ability check. Unlike the meta magic where you got to re-roll a d20, um, all my cases for why I didn't like that don't necessarily apply here because this is an ability that you're automatically getting. So I, it doesn't need to take up one of my meta magic options. Yeah. One of the things that's interesting about this one is that you don't have to be proficient in that ability. So if you have an embarrassing moment where like you as your sorcerer have to make an athletics check or an acrobatics check or even a knowledge check, you can kind of brute force your way into advantage with this. And brute for one sorcerer point, giving yourself kind of advantage on an ability check when you wish you had it is kind of a sweet deal. Yeah. And I think like even especially if you are proficient in an ability and you thought you were going to nail an important scene where your character is the one who could nail it and you went ahead and rolled a one and fell flat on your face or are mm -hmm. trying to convince somebody or deceive somebody and you roll that really bad roll. Now's the time to use a sorcery point to be like, this is one of the most important things that I'm about to do and I'm the one in the party who can do it. It's time to nail that roll. You know, it's also pretty nasty you can use this with spells potentially you might be able to use this with spells like telekinesis or bigby's hand there are certain spells that do allow you to make ability checks as part of that spell and so i and you know a really good example um counter spell counter spell uses an ability check so one sorcery point to fix your bad counter spell not bad yeah so as we move on from the Sorcerer to the Warlock, another great spellcaster who uh, got some really awesome features here in Tasha's. And again, a brand new, a bunch of additions to their spell list. Oh yeah. Again, they get Mind Sliver. They don't get Mind Whip, but they do get a lot of the summoning spells. For the Warlock in particular, Summon Fey is fantastic. Summon Aberration is really on brand and Summon Shadow Spawn is also awesome. Warlocks with their limited number of spell slots get a lot of mileage out of a summoning spell because it's they scale nicely with the way the Warlock spell slots scale up and they put a body on the board that has a lot of versatility and can also contribute to damage. What I also like coming from a roleplay perspective is that with the broad range of summoning spells, you really get to pick your flavor. It feels like your warlock patron sending you a minion. Depending on yeah. which patron you picked, one of the summoning spells suits that vibe. Yeah, right. Um, so I think that this is thematically appropriate. Um, and I... I I don't know. I would kind of make it a house rule that your patron just gives you the appropriate summon spell. That would be a cool like addition to if you want to buff up your warlock. Or I actually did this in, in my own campaign where I, I modified one of these summoning spells for Joe's warlock and gave it to him, him as a piece of treasure, as a reward for a quest. And it was a really cool reward. We also get a brand new pact that you can choose with your Warlock, and that is the Pact of the Talisman. You get to wear a cool talisman. With this talisman, when you fail an ability check, you get to roll a d4 and add that to it. Uh, this is neat, but honestly, I don't think it compares to the other pacts that we have. I, I would rather yeah. take any of the other packs, I think. I think the familiar... The Pact of the Chain is a bigger deal. I think the Pact of the Blade, if you're going that route, is a bigger deal. A lot of the, the things like the Pact of the Chain and the Pact of the Blade and the Pact of the Tome feel like they're really changing your playstyle in the way that they're giving you familiar or giving you more cantrips and ultimately then more rituals. The Talisman is doing some interesting things and the invocations that come with it are kind of neat, yeah. but they feel very muted to me. I don't know if I would take the talisman over the other options. What I might say is the talisman's a good choice for somebody who uh, maybe feels like they have terrible luck with dice rolls and also is newer to the game and doesn't want the complications. Perhaps. Uh, com yeah. The complexity of the other ones. I would read the invocations that are tied to the talisman and see if they speak to you. But otherwise, I, I just think I'd go with one of the other options. In addition, warlocks also get eldritch versatility. This is going to work much in the same way as the other versatility features. When we get an ability score increase, we can change out our cantrips, but we can also change our Pact Boon. So you could switch from the Pact of the Blade to the Pact of the Talisman. You could try out the Talisman, switch it back out again, 
And at higher levels, the Warlock can also retrain their Mystic Arcanums, which are their high-level spells, which is actually admittedly really nice and needed, in my opinion. Warlocks also get a bunch of new invocations to choose from, which is great. We always love more invocations. We're not going to go over all of them right now, but there are a few standout options. Uh, my personal favorite here being Eldritch Mind, which if you're struggling for feats and can't find a way to fit the Warcaster feat, Eldritch Mind gives you advantage on your concentration checks without having to use a feat choice. This is a big deal for especially Hexblades who really, really want to have a bolster to their concentration checks. Um, my multi-class Paladin Hexblade is definitely going to take this because it's hard to wait a long time for Warcaster or Resilient. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's a big, big boon. I also really like Investment of the Chainmaster, which yeah. is a gigantic upgrade to the familiar given by the Pact of the Chain. I really like it. It's great. Uh, Pact of the Chain was already my favorite pact. I love Find Familiar. The Warlock being able to take this already amazing spell and say, I am the master of having a familiar is, is awesome. With their already expanded list of options for their familiar, this just feels so good. I also really like Undying Servitude is a great option here. Hey, we want to be able to have some undead creatures and getting Animate Dead on your Warlock, even though you can only use it once per day, this is to kind of prevent you from using Warlock spell slots to cast it over and over and over again and build a massive undead army, which is cool as that is. It's probably a little on the problematic side, but at least you can have some undead minions, which I think is great. Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, depending on the theme and the vibe, which Warlocks are actually pretty versatile in the theme and role-playing potential, mm. especially with the invocations. And a lot of these invocations advertise uh, unique additions to the way to play your Warlock. The other one that uh, has come up in our games that Joe took Gift of the Protectors to give that kind of um, death uh, ward feature to your entire party, which is super great. Um, we'll, we've, we haven't seen it come up yet, but I think for our group in particular, it'll be pretty useful. I mean, if you are running a party that doesn't have a lot of healers and you're worried about going down to zero hit points, yeah, it's a good yeah. pickup. Finally, we move on to the wizard, the spellcaster of all spellcasters, and their main benefit that they're going to get from Tasha's is going to be their expanded spell list. Now, there's many choices here, but notably compared to the other two, they get all of the goodies. They get Mind Sliver, <laughs> they get Mind Whip, and they get a lot of the summoning options yes, here. Yes, indeed. So there's more on top of that, but having the wizard get all of the above, uh, great. The wizard also gets Spirit Shroud, and they've added Enhanceability, Augury, and Divination. So Divination Wizards can now actually cast Divination. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a lot of a lot of additions for the wizard. Actually, some pretty good pickups that I definitely would be taking with my wizards. Um, I've loved using Conjure Fae with my wizard as well. I think it's it, I'm really excited about that spell in particular because wizards can just add any of these spells to their spell book. You're probably just gonna want them all. <laughs> yeah, and I think like additions that may seem kind of weird, like Spirit Shroud. If you think for something like the Blade Singer, if you look at the cantrips, you're also getting Booming Blade and Green Flame yeah. Blade, which are clearly here to say that if you're playing a Blade Singer, there are options to make you more Blade Singery. Yeah, we didn't mention this because Booming Blade has been a part of the game for a while, but this is on all the class spells for all three of these classes. They all get kind of those sword magey sort of cantrips, um, but. The wizard, I think, with the blade singer, can make the most of them. Interestingly, I think with the way hex blades work, you might use use it, but hex blades kind of yeah. You use them for the first couple levels, but eventually you get extra attack, right? So yeah, I I think overall this uh, expansion on the wizard spell list, I mean, it, it belongs here. Wizards deserve to have the most options for spells in the game because they're wizards. Yeah, but they get one other fun little optional perk, which is called Cantrip Versatility. Once per day, when you finish your long rest, your wizard can change one of the cantrips that you have for another cantrip that you don't have. So instead of having to wait for a level up, instead of having to wait for an ability score increase, every morning your wizard can just change one of their cantrips out. I love this. I already have made great use for it in, in one of our games. And it's just like... 
it's so much better than what everyone else got for their changing out their cantrips. You know, what's what's great about this is wizards are the intelligent character at the yeah. table, which means that if you as a player have the foresight to know what situations you're going to be dealing with, if you're about to venture up the mountain to fight a red dragon and you have Firebolt as your main damage cantrip, you might want to switch that out for a different damage type. And you can do that. And I think that's really cool that the wizard can kind of be yeah. that planner and say, what situation am I getting into? And is there a cantrip that better suits my needs? A lot of cantrips can be really, really helpful in clutch situations. And I think this is actually a really good ability. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in one of our aforementioned games, we found out that we were going to be facing a nest of mean locks. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to bring the light cantrip and cast it on my forehead. And that turned out to be a game changer. Yeah. Um, and Because I wouldn't have otherwise taken the light cantrip. Cantrips are such a fundamental thing, but sometimes they can just be an ace in the hole in a really weird way. And I think being able to change out your primary damage dealing cantrip is great, but then also be able to grab one of those weird utility ones for all those strange corner cases that come up really does add a lot of versatility to an already stupidly versatile class. So this has been a look at the features added in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything for the Sorcerers, Warlocks, and Wizards. If you've been playing around with some of these new features or new spell options, tell us about them in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our Patreon by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6pm Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more takes on all the subclasses and classes of D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.